Welcome to the Strange Podcast and YouTube Video Show. I am so excited about today's guest is a fellow Coloradan um, that's into cemetery wandering like Mr. Martini and I are. And we are going to talk about the, some of our favorite cemeteries here in Colorado. Um, the one thing about Colorado, we have some very interesting cemeteries and um, they're definitely w worth a look-see. And we also have some very famous people buried here in Colorado, um, such as um, Buffalo Bill Cody. He's buried just above uh, Golden, Colorado. And um, Doc Holliday. And a lot of people don't realize that, that Doc Holliday is buried here in uh, Glenwood Springs. Um, I actually have a video coming out on our YouTube channel um, that will show you Doc Holliday's grave. And we also have a video out that's totally dedicated to visiting his grave and why he ended up in Colorado, um, Glenwood Springs, not Colorado Springs. <laughs> but today's guest is a podcaster and their podcast is The Ordinary Extraordinary Cemetery. And this podcast is for cemetery lovers preservers, and even those who have never walked amongst the graves. There are two hosts to this podcast. It's Jenny and Diane, and they explore old cemeteries and learn the stories of those who are buried within those, their walls. After all, and I love this catchphrase that you guys have, every death had a life and every life had a story. I just love that tagline. Well, <laughs> thank you. Just <laughs> it's just so true. There's so much history in a cemetery and, and they are kind of on the same mission that we've been when it comes to cemeteries of bringing those people's stories alive and showing you how much history um, and how wonderful a cemetery and how beautiful a cemetery can actually be. And that these people should not be forgotten because a lot of them had to do with you know, pioneering uh, the, the West or some special event. And they may not be famous in history books, but they took, uh, took part of some very famous events. So today we are joined by Jenny. Uh, Diane could not um, come today. So Jenny is um, going to be joining us today. So welcome, Jenny. Hi, thank you so much. Oh, <clears throat> apparently I got a little frog in my throat there. <laughs> Thank you. I am super excited to be here. Diane was very disappointed she couldn't make it work today, but um, she's with us in spirit, I promise. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that we've been trying to get together for a long time now. We have. Um, Jenny and Diane and, and I first met on Facebook um, in the many cemetery groups um, that we all belong <laughs> to. And yes, there are many cemetery groups on Facebook. Uh, people who love to take pictures of the beautiful artistry um, mm -hmm. that's in a cemetery or to uh, preserve the history, um, just all different walks of life that like to go into cemeteries. Um, and so we met there and especially when we started the strange podcast, we had a lot in common and they live in Colorado. <laughs> I, that's one of the best things is we all live in the same state. So that makes it even more fun. <laughs> and so hopefully soon we'll all be able to get together and yes very wandering uh, together, but we all have some favorite cemeteries uh, that we wanted to talk about today that are just have so much interesting history in them. But first off, tell us a little bit about your podcast. Sure. So the Ordinary Extraordinary Cemetery podcast, like you said, it's where we're telling the stories of those buried in the cemeteries. And it was our intention not to focus on famous grave sites, but to focus on everyday people and to really dig into their stories and find out why they're buried in that particular cemetery, what brought them to the community where they lived and died, um, and, 
and in a lot of cases, how those communities then formed. Um, and that's really the basis for what we do. Now we have, we have featured some famous people and we do that from time to time because there's always an interest in that too. Um, but our sole focus is really just telling the stories of everybody, um, kind of digging into genealogy a little bit and, and just helping bring those stories to life. And our focus really has been on a lot of the smaller cemeteries around the U.S. Um, we've had guests from other states that have come on and talked about cemeteries that they help manage um, and that they run and that they've researched. Um, we've also had guests um, talk about what they do to restore cemeteries when they get damaged in natural disasters and things like that. And we're hoping in the future we'll also have some more that talk about actual preservation and stuff for some of these really old cemeteries that, you know, time and nature it, without even like extra vandalism or humans or anything like that, just time and, and nature kind of take over and do what they do. So hopefully we'll have some guests on soon that will help uh, talk about how to do some preservation work in these old cemeteries as well. It always frustrates me. You talk about vandalism. Right. I mean, why? <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't get it at all. <laughs> I don't get it at all. Well, you know? and vandalism, and as you know, because you're in so many of the Facebook groups, it has a lot of different faces. I mean, there's the ones that go in and purposely like spray paint things and knock tombs over and, and do serious damage. But then there's people that do vandalism without even realizing they're doing it. Like they don't mean to do it, but um, sometimes they try to clean a grave, like a headstone the wrong way, using the wrong um, materials and things. And that is not purposely vandalizing it, but it is damaging a headstone um, or leaving things behind in a cemetery that shouldn't be left, things like that. That happens on a more regular basis than we'd like to see. So hopefully our podcast will help bring some attention to some of that so that folks are more aware of, especially if you're on the preservation side, you want to help preserve things, you want to help fix something that's broken or whatever, we can help teach people to do that the right way. Exactly. You know, people don't realize they're damaging it when they're trying to clean up, you know, there's certain ways of doing it. You right. know, I was so appalled. I went to, um, uh, Caribou, the ghost town, which is oh, yeah. up in the mountains above Boulder. And there's a hidden cemetery there that a lot of people don't even know exists. And um, so we hiked up to it. And when I got to it, I was really appalled to see that every single headstone had been broken. Mm -hmm. And you could tell that it was vandalism and not because of the snow or, right. you know, or just, you know, being old and stuff that you could tell that people had taken baseball bats to, you know, the taller monuments and stuff. And luckily they're, they're trying to restore the cemetery, but restoration of vandalism, it, it, it you, yeah, you're restoring it, but it's, you're, you, you, just that it was originally destroyed from its, you know, right. original beauty, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's heartbreaking. Or if it's getting replaced by something modern, it takes away from what, what it was, the exactly. history that it was preserving and the artistry that it was mm -hmm. preserving. And it so. takes away from the story of the person who's buried there. You know, that was, that's part of their story. That's where their life ends. And so when somebody goes in and purposely damages you know, headstones and cemeteries, you're taking away from that person's story. Exactly. And I think there's very few people in history whose stories you actually want to forget or take away. I mean, there's a few people out there in historical <laughs> terms that we would prefer <laughs> not to remember or have never been born. But in most cases, you want those stories to, to live on because there's somebody in their family or somebody who knew them that, you know, you want to preserve that story for them. Exactly. You know, when you said that the first person that came to mind was Shivington. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what a dirt bag. <laughs> he really was. Uh, well, I always think Hitler. I'm like, we don't need to really yeah. remember him, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, those of you that don't know Shivington, he was um, involved in the Sand Creek Massacre. And you know, Massacre is, you know, something that he's is his middle name, which is kind of un is unfortunate about the history of this man because he was also a hero in the, the Gettysburg of the West, which was a battle in Glorieta, um, New Mexico. For those of you who didn't know, it's there was actually a Civil War battle in um, New Mexico, in northern New Mexico, and he actually saved the day 
and then turned around and was involved with the leading the Sand Creek Massacre. Yeah. But one thing about him, when you're talking about genealogy, I researched, he's buried here in Denver in Fairmont mm -hmm. Cemetery. And um, when I was researching him, I found out that he married his daughter-in-law after his son died oh. and to take, you know, which was, you know, it was common for people to get remarried after somebody right. dies back in the late 1800s, um, you know, because women didn't work and they had children. And so he had grandchildren and he married his daughter-in-law and then abandoned her. <laughs> That's so, I, I've heard of a lot of times, maybe a brother would marry you know, their sister-in-law or something in that, but I don't think I've ever heard the father-in-law marrying the daughter-in-law. Yeah. He was a piece of work. And I, yeah. there's some write-ups that are talk about, um, that talk about how he abandoned her. Like she's got journal writings and mm. she ended up having to move back with her parents in Nebraska where she's buried now. Cause I was like, how did she end up in Nebraska? <laughs> and basically she had no other place to go. <laughs> yeah. and he stayed in Denver and so he, he definitely was a piece of work. <laughs> crazy, crazy, crazy. So, so how did you get into this? Well, I've had a love of cemeteries, at least since I was a teenager. Um, there was a cemetery that was right across the street from the high school that I went to in Nebraska. Um, and some of us would hang out there. And just there was that peaceful feeling of this is a really kind of cool place. And of course, this was a small cemetery in a small Nebraska town that... Um, was full of farmers and their families and things like that. And I think from there, it just kind of grew. And then as I, as an adult, um, I started visiting cemeteries more often. Well, actually when my oldest daughter was a baby, there was one not too far from us and we used to go for walks through it. I'd stick her in the stroller and we'd walk through the cemetery and it's just, and it developed. And as I've gotten older, I just started researching more. I wanted to know more about the people buried in these cemeteries. You look at some of these headstones and some of them are so grand and gorgeous and they're, you know, the carvings on them are so unique in some cases and you just, it just makes you want to know more. So um, with all of that, when, once the pandemic hit, I was like, you know, I've got some free time. Why don't I start this podcast and start sharing some of the research that I've been doing? So it really started with our research on central or with my research that I had been doing um, over the summer with Central City and their cemeteries. Um, and then it's just grown from there. And when I hooked up with um, Diane, she um, she's in Colorado Springs and she actually works for the Evergreen Cemetery down there. And she um, formed the Evergreen Foundation. And so they do some preservation work and things down there. And so we hooked up together and just started sharing these stories. And it became our goal, not only to focus on all the Colorado cemeteries that we can, but also cemeteries around the the U.S. And so we've had just a fun time researching cemeteries and stories and, and the people buried there. And we were absolutely loving it. And um, our little podcast is just it's like the highlight of our week every Monday when we get together to do our um, recordings and we love doing it. So that's where it really started. Well, you definitely go down a rabbit hole, don't you? you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> especially with the genealogy. And then you end up in like five different cemeteries when you're doing your research. Going, exactly. Well, why did these this family was buried here, but then why was the husband over here? And you're just, you're trying to rebuild their stories based on where they're buried mm -hmm. and what brought them there. And, you know, did they get stuck there because they were sick and, you know, it just, right. it, it's a rabbit hole. It really is. And, but it's, I mean, you can spend hours and hours researching it and be up all night researching these rabbit holes, but it's so worth it. I think in the end, um, and like I said, it started really with central city, um, my kids and I had been going up there a lot just to visit and we love, it's a great, um, if you love to photograph cemeteries, those cemeteries are a great place to do a lot of photography year round because of the, the way the seasons change up there in the mountains. And so, and there's a ton, a ton of aspen trees up there. So in the summer, it's very green and shady and peaceful. And in the fall, you get the gold from the aspen. And then of course, in the winter, it's all very bare. And so you have very different um, feelings when you're in that cemeteries up there. Um, but it's just, and in the summer too, um, it's full of wildflowers. The mountain has really kind of taken it back over in a lot of places. So there's a lot of grass and a lot of wildflowers and trees, and it's not maintained. None of the cemeteries that are right there are maintained the way that we think of like cemeteries in cities are maintained. It's very natural and you just find the headstones among the trees and the wildflowers and everything. And it's, it's such a gorgeous, peaceful place. And 
usually it's pretty quiet. There is a like a four wheeling place that's not too far from there. So sometimes in the summer you can hear the four wheelers going, but other times of the year is so peaceful and so quiet up there because it's removed from everything else. And so unless there's other people wandering through the cemetery, you're not hearing anything and you're just seeing, you know, nature and history kind of grow together again. So I, I love going up there and there's so many unique headstones up there. Um, and just the stories. And there's a lot of people that do visit. Um, if you look, there's on the headstones, you will find coins and you will find toys on a lot of the children's graves. Um, there was a picture that we just looked at that has a jar of honey sitting on that one. So people leave all kinds of little trinkets on these headstones. And it's, it's just a fabulous cemetery to visit. I should say cemeteries because it's six cemeteries kind of all together in one spot right above the town. So that's... So so for those of you that, are, that aren't familiar with Central City, um, it is a mountain community um, up in the mountains above the Golden and, and Boulder area. Yes. And it was a mining area. Um, so when Colorado had its mining boom, Black Hawk and Central City, which are our sister towns, are literally connected to each other, mm -hmm. um, started back in the 1800s um, during our gold and silver booms here in Colorado. 1859, actually. What was it? <laughs> 1859. 1859. Mm -hmm. Is when and gold was discovered there. And so it was a, it, the Central City was a really thriving city and um, they're still just beautiful historical buildings still preserved yes. there. But the problem with the two cities is that they were off the beaten path. And so when they built uh, Highway 70, um, another city, Idaho Springs, which is right beneath it, it got all the like tourism and people coming and going. And Central City and, and Blackhawk were dying. They were becoming ghost towns because nobody would, was coming up there after, you know, gold was ran out and silver. Um, you, there's actually another ghost town that's up there called um, Nevada. Nevada. Nevadaville, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Nevadaville. Yep. And um, in order to bring people back up there, they legalized gambling. There's only three places that you can legally gamble in Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, Blackhawk, Central City, and Cripple Creek. Yep. And Blackhawk and Central City are right next to each other. And so people go up there to stay for the weekend and they've got like high rise hotels and, you know, a lot of the old buildings have become casinos. And I, I love going up there in the winter. Mm -hmm. And, and staying, you know, at one of the hotels up there, um, what's it called? Am Amstar? Ameristar. Ameristar. Mm -hmm. Ameristar. I love staying in that hotel. And it just, is luxury. <laughs> yes, it is. And they have this beautiful pool on the 11th floor. And, you know, when it's in the depths of winter, it's just really nice to have a staycation up there. It is. And yeah. what's interesting, so Blackhawk, so really for Colorado, for our gold rush, it really did start. It, there was some gold discovered a little bit before 1859, but our major gold rush actually did start in the Central City Blackhawk area where it was discovered um, by, hang on, I have his name right here, um, John H. Gregory. He's the one who struck it rich there, and it was because of him so many people came to Colorado um, for the gold mining. And so for a very, for quite a number of years, Central City and Blackhawk were sort of the epic center of Colorado's um, of where all the money and stuff was coming from. And it was being handled down in Denver and stuff, but it really, for a while, they considered making Central City the capital. Um, it was for a very short while and stuff, but because of its location, because it's up in the mountains and it is uh, difficult to get to, especially then it was a lot harder to get up into the mountains. Um, eventually they decided Denver was a better place to make the capital and send all the money and the gold down there from the mountains. Um, but it's always been a very, um, those communities up there are just tough. The people that settled there and started mining there and those families that have stuck around um, since 1859 are tough mountain people and they've persevered. And yeah, when they made, they legalized the gambling in the nineties, Blackhawk really kind of took it over and they built those fancy new casinos and the fancy new hotels. Central City decided they wanted to stick with their historic roots. And so they've really tried hard to maintain all of their historic buildings that are in their downtown area. Um, and there are casinos inside many of them, but there's also some shopping and some other little things there. And they also have a fabulous museum 
um, that goes through the entire his mining history of the area um, and, and their firefighting history because they were very into their firefighters there and it was a big thing. And also baseball was a big part of their life in those oh, communities really? up there. Oh yes, there used to be where it, now, if you go into Central City, there's like a main parking lot where you can kind of park to walk through the, the town and everything. That used to be their baseball diamond. Um, they used to have a baseball diamond there. And I don't, I don't have any pictures of it, um, but there are pictures online you can find um, of their baseball diamond. But they had a baseball team that for a while was very good, apparently. So, and then their other big sport was, um, and it was a popular thing in Colorado in general, was firefighters um, would have all these competitions um, and the Central City firefighters were very good, but they had like engine pulling competitions and lime climbing competitions. And, you know, how fast can you get your hoses out and all the things that firefighters would have to do, but it was a big competition and they would have these annual competitions amongst firefighters from the different mountain communities and stuff. And central city is, uh, was one of the top ones up there in their, their firefighters, they were strong and they could fast and get those fires out. And so it was a big part of, um, the kind of free time when they had activities that they were doing when they weren't mining. Um, but the mining was a big chunk of um, how the community made money up until about the 1930s. So from 1859 up until about 1930s, and then mining kind of fell off. <laughs> so, and there is still some mining happening up there, but not like it was, and it'll never go back. Um, there's actually quite a bit of gold still in the mountains. It's just not very accessible anymore. They've kind of mined what they could get to and that's kind of where it ends. So yeah, now it's more of a tourist. I didn't know that about the, the firemen. Oh yeah, it's very cool. So if you go to their museum, the, it's the Gilpin County History Museum, and there's a whole section in the museum dedicated to their firefighters, and they have their equipment, and they have pictures of them doing their competitions, and it was a very um, prestigious thing to be one of the firemen, and to be on that team, and, and to do um, the firefighting for them. So it was, yeah, it was a big part of what they did in the community. And of course, fires were something they had to um, fight regularly because it's a, in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Also when Central City and Blackhawk um, and Nevadaville and all the other little ghost towns that are around there that are no longer running, but almost all of those buildings originally were wood. And so um, they did have a big fire there. Uh, and I can't remember what the year was, but there was a large fire there at one point through Central City, and it burned down nearly all of the buildings um, because everything in that area, the only things that did not burn, um, there's a house that was um, an office for a lawyer. It's still standing. Um, the one hotel is still standing. The one original hotel is still there because it was actually built of brick and it was built with steel shutters. So it kind of stopped the fire from going in that direction on that side of town. Um, and I believe there's one other building on the other end of the street that was also brick, but everything else, all the wood buildings that had been um, in between all those brick buildings all burned um, because they were wooden. Uh, so when they rebuilt, which they rebuilt within two years, they like rebuilt all the community, but that's when the city said everything has to be more fireproof. So now when you go, all those buildings that are from 18, I think about 1880 are all brick. And that's because they were trying to avoid having their city burn completely down to the ground again. So they had to deal with burning. Blackhawk actually had to worry more about flooding because they're below central city. So the mountain, the water and stuff from the mountains, especially the snows melting would like rush down the mountains through Blackhawk. Uh -huh. And so Blackhawk got flooded out many times and they lost um, people during those floods and a lot of animals and stuff um, because it would just come right through the center of town and wash everything out, but they would just rebuild it all and start over. Well, Blackhawk was more of a camp, wasn't it? It, well, they were both mining. They had mines and weather each places, but there were more of the mines were up near Central City. Blackhawk became where the smelter is and where they were doing all of that. So they were really two different communities. Um, Black, Central City became known as the richest square mile on earth because there was so much gold that they were pulling from the mines around in and around Central City. And if, if you ever get a chance to go up in that area, you can see a lot of the old mines um, you know, where they've abandoned the mines and you can see the mine shafts and the buildings around the mines and everything. Um, but what they would do is they would haul the gold and stuff out of those mines and then it would be processed down in Blackhawk. And then from there, it would go to Idaho Springs and then out to Denver from there it was kind of the, the route that it took. Um, but um, so they were connected and there's actually technically, 
and it's not called this anymore, but technically Black Hawk and Central City were connected by another little community called Mountain City, which was right in between. And Mountain City is kind of actually where the gold was actually first discovered. And eventually it kind of became incorporated into Central City. But if you do historical research and you read about it, they will talk about Mountain City being part of that community. And it's really what connects um, Black Hawk and Central City together so that it all kind of, because you go down the mountain to Black Hawk and you would go through Mountain City. And there were a lot of folks that settled in Mountain City. So I've never even heard of Mountain City before. Because <laughs> they don't call it that anymore. Um, unless you're up there, like I said, I didn't know about it until I really started doing the research. But there is a technically a very small section between the two towns that would technically be Mountain City. It just got incorporated into Central City. And Central City, actually, the proper name for that town is the City of Central. Um, and it Central City is actually its nickname. But for all legal purposes, it's actually the city of Central. So, I didn't yeah, know that. This, this is what happens when you start going down those rabbit holes. <laughs> <laughs> you start learning all those little things and you're like, Phew. so, and then as far as their cemeteries go, so their original cemetery was actually not where it's at now. Their original cemetery was, Central City is built kind of in levels because it's on the mountain. So you go up a level and then up another level. And they had a lot of, um, when they really started mining it, they brought in miners from Cornwall, England. Cornish miners were in high demand because in England they were mining coal, but they had the skills and the technology to mine underground. They had learned how to do that in England. So these Cornish miners were in high demand. So they were coming over here to Colorado to start once we went um, placer mining, which is where you just, you know, you get the gold in the, in the river and you're panning for it and all of that. Once they really weren't getting any more gold from that and decided they had to go down into the ground and build actual mines, they were bringing over these Cornish miners. So one of the things these Cornish miners did to help build up the city was build all these brick, or they're not brick, they're um, stone walls that kind of make different levels to the city. So it's kind of like, it kind of does the zigzaggy thing up. They terraced it. Uh-huh, they terraced it, and it's gorgeous. So the original cemetery was actually up behind where the um, old school is. It, it's up by where the old school building is. It was up there, um, and it was there. It was probably first used around 1860. I couldn't find an exact date on that one, um, and it was used for about 20 years. In 1880, the, the town decided to move it to where it currently is, um, but... In 1863, the Catholic cemetery had already formed where it's currently at. And so did the, there was another, one of the other ones was over there. Um, and I was trying to remember which one it was. Um, so two of the cemeteries in 1863, oh, the Masons Cemetery. Um, mm -hmm. Those two were formed in different places. But then by 1880, Central City had decided to open their cemetery across the road from the Catholic cemetery. And then right next door to the Central City Cemetery, you have the Knights of Pythias Cemetery, um, which I'm assuming at one time may have been separated by a fence. It is no longer like they just run into, like if you're walking through them, you're gonna walk through both cemeteries, but they still have their separate gates. So you can go in either gate and see um, both cemeteries. Um, and then there's also the, uh, the one little bitty cemetery that's right there. I'm trying to think of which one it is. Um, that's completely kind of separate. It's hard to get to, like you have to go down through a ditch and back up and it's roped off. Then on the other side, you have the Catholic cemetery, uh, you have the Odd Fellows Cemetery and you have the Redmond Lodge Cemetery across the road. So all three of those are kind of together. So all six cemeteries you can wander through in one day. It's a lot of headstones, a lot of wandering, um, but it's such it a shows beautiful you how many view. people used to live there. Yes. I mean, <laughs> thousands of people lived there. Um, I mean, first it was the men, but then their, their families started coming out. And really, Central City and Black Hawk are a little bit different from some other Western gold mining communities. They did boom, but they really, from the beginning, wanted to be family-oriented communities. So while they each sort of had a red light district, they weren't big, it was always churches went up right away, schools went up right away. The communities were always supposed to be family-centered communities. So that's that that's where it's a little different than some other Western boom towns that we hear about. They didn't have the 
as much of the criminal activity and stuff that other places had. And they don't have, there's a few bad guys that went through town, but not as many as some other places. But yet they have that day. What's that day they have with the, the madam? Oh, yeah. yes. That's, <laughs> um, oh, I can't remember what they call that. Um, well, like I said, Central City, more so than Black Hawk. Black Hawk had like two locations where you could go for a good mm -hmm. time. Central City did have an actual street section um, with a few madams. And they had some very famous madams. The thing is, their madams, it, it's so funny. When I read through some of the journals and stuff, the, the proper ladies of the town didn't really mind these other ladies being there because they knew it kept the single minors away from their daughters when they didn't want them to, <laughs> you know, they could go for a good time, get what they needed and not be all over their daughters. So they, it was in their mind, it was kind of a necessity to have this little red light district. They just didn't want to see them or talk to them or interact with them. But at the same time, those ladies, the madams that ran those houses and stuff, they're, the fines that they paid and the things they did actually supported a lot of what went on in that town. So it helped support the fire department. It helped support the sheriff. It helped support a lot of things because they had to pay their fines and it was fine because it was a win-win for everybody because they were protected. They got their business. They stayed out of the way. So like it, it's funny to think of it, but some of those ladies and, and stuff thought these other ladies were a necessary part of life. They just didn't want to mingle with them. So they so stayed funny. in their I wish I could remember town. the name of that day they have. So they go through the town, they have a parade with beds yes. <laughs> down the middle of the street. Let me see. Madame Lou brunch day. Yes. In, in Central City. And, and, they she, and they basically have this like race and parade down the middle of the street with um, people on um, beds. Yep. On the old <laughs> brass bedsteads and they're dressed in, you know, their um, ladies of the evening outfits and, you know, it's, it's a, and Madame Lou Bunch was probably their most famous um, madam that they had. And she, and again, she was actually kind of a pillar of their community. She gave a lot of money to the community. She helped fund the school system and all these things. Um, she, you know, was just a little out there, but she also was not willing necessarily like some of the other madams and stuff, but kind of stay hidden. They'd stay in their brothels. They'd stay, you know, where they were supposed to. She didn't care. She would go out in her carriage. She would take her girls out to advertise. She would do things um, a little bit differently. <laughs> so she was, she was not the shy, quiet type of lady that hid behind <laughs> her doors. Um, she got out there in the community, but she was kind of a pillar of the community as well. So, and she is not buried there. Um, I believe she's buried in Denver somewhere, but I don't quote me on that. I could be wrong. <laughs> oh, now so, I have to find out. <laughs> yeah. She, I always as far as everybody's I'm, buried, <laughs> as far as I know, from the research I've done, none of the madams are buried up there. Now there may be some of the other ladies that had worked for those madams buried there. I haven't come across them yet. Um, there are quite a few graves that are unmarked um, either because they never were marked in the first place or because just with time, the, um, the grave markers just aren't there anymore. Right. So they could be there. I just don't know where they're at. <laughs> so, well, up um, on the screen, you um, had shared, a, this is a, um, I don't even know what you would call this, some type of mausoleum. <laughs> so what I found out us, about tell this. Tell us about this. First, let's describe the picture for our podcast yes. people. Um, so this is a brick structure that's in the shape of a cone. Um, kind of looks like a beehive. It, yeah, it looks like a beehive and it's all red brick and part of it is completely broken open mm -hmm. and it, there's nothing inside. It's hollow inside. So you, you and this is in the Catholic cemetery. Yes. So, so you need to tell us about this. <laughs> so what I have been told when I started really researching this, um, I was told that this was built by, so the Catholic cemetery, we have to kind of go through the history of the Catholic cemetery a little bit. Um, the Catholic cemetery is interesting in that it has a German, a German section, an Italian section, a Polish section, and an English section. Um, all of them are Catholic, but they all, if you go through it, you're going to find the different sections for the different communities that were there. This is in the Italian section. And what I was told in doing my research that this was built by a gentleman whose wife passed away, um, but it was her wish to be buried in Italy. She did not want to be buried in Colorado. But she died in the winter. It was, it was not going to be easy to ship her body back to Italy at the time. So this was actually built to house her body until it could be sent back 
to the old country. And so that from what I've been told, that's all it was ever used for was to store the one body and she was completely bricked in and everything until it was time to send her home. And then they opened it up and sent her home. But that still stands there as a, as a reminder, <laughs> I oh guess. Oh my goodness. Is there any kind of plaque associated with it? Nope. Or? This was, I um, found that information out from another historian who was doing research on the family. And so that's what he had told me when he was going through it, but there's nothing that commemorates it or anything like that. And so a lot of people don't know what it is. Um, if you go inside it, what I find interesting, cause I've been inside of it. Um, people have like put little hearts in there and so-and-so loves so-and-so and all of that on the inside, which it's vandalism. But at the same time, I find it kind of romantic in the fact that it was built to hold somebody's wife so that he could send her home. Like right, it was, right. it's kind of a love story. So about, about how tall is this? Um, I would say eight or nine feet high. Like you can, you can totally stand up inside at the, the top point. Right, and I right. don't know if I'm kind of thinking there may have been a cross or something on the top at one time. Yeah. Um, that's just not there anymore. Cause if you look, there's something on top of it and I don't know what that was, but I'm kind of wondering if at some point there had been a little cross or something up there. Which would make um, sense being in the Catholic cemetery. Right. I'm so curious about its shape. It's beehive shape. Why they chose to you do this shape. Yeah, I don't, you know? I don't think anybody knows that yet. I'm hoping at some point somebody else who's more knowledgeable will figure that one out. It, because it really does stand out. There's nothing in any of the other cemeteries even close to looking like that. It's the only one there um, that's like that. And so, it's double walled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know if maybe they used it after they used it for the one, like maybe they used it a, a few times to hold bodies. Cause again, in the winter, it gets a little tricky to try and bury some of those bodies if the ground's really frozen. Yes. So there is a chance maybe they used it, but you would think, especially, and I thought initially because it's in the Catholic cemetery. So before I started really researching it, that maybe it was a shrine or something and you'd find statuary inside or anything, but there's nothing in it. It's completely empty inside. So. Okay. And you also did the um, Knights of Pythias mm -hmm. and that's the way you pronounce it, correct? Knights of Pythias. Yes. yes. So it's just yeah. another fraternal organizations. Um, minors, at least here in Colorado, but I'm pretty sure it was the same in most places tended to belong to a lot of these fraternal organizations um, because they acted as sort of the life insurance policies for these minors. So you would join these organizations. So um, Knights of Pythias, the Odd Fellows, the Masons, um, and part of you would pay dues as a member. Um, but a big part of what all of these organizations did then was to make sure that when you died or when your spouse died or your children died, that you got a proper funeral and burial and a headstone to mark your grave. Um, headstones even then were pricey. And so this was a way to guarantee that you had a proper funeral and um, that your grave was marked. And also if in the case of a minor, if they died, this would also help sort of ensure that there was somebody to help financially take care of their family for a time until the widow could figure out other means of supporting herself. So um, this picture here that you're showing now, this is the champion family plot. Um, there's actually another baby buried there who's um, head uh, grave is not marked. Um, but the champions, there's the book that I've got posted in there. Um, that is sort of based on the wife's diaries and stuff. Her um, great, great granddaughter. I think it's great. One great, maybe two great granddaughters went back through and, and wrote down her life story. Well, the life story of the couple um, and their journey from England to central city and um and how they're all buried there so it's a fascinating story but the champions um he came over first um his name is hugh champion and he actually came over from england um first um in 1861 uh he was trying to they were engaged but they weren't married um he was struggling to find good work in england found out about the mining opportunities in Colorado. So he came to Colorado. Two years later, he sent for um, Lavinia and she came over and they got married the day she arrived in Central City. They, um, he had arranged with um, another lady in town, uh, a widow, who at first Lavinia was a little suspicious of because, you know, here's the single lady with a really nice cabin and Hugh had a key to her cabin. 
but really she had just arranged it so that she could get in there and freshen up and put on the wedding dress that she had made. And they got married right there on the mountain. They had a pastor and everything that way they could go home to their little cabin together. Um, and th from there on, they lived in and around central city for their entire married life. Uh, there were a few times they went up to some of the other communities a little further up the mountain, but really most of their life centered around um, central city, mountain city and Nevadaville, which are all right there. Um, they had all their children there. Um, they had two children that died while um, they were still, while the parents were still alive. Hugh actually died at 40 years old due to the condition of his lungs from all the years of mining. Um, he had the black lung disease and that's what eventually killed him. Um, but she continued to run sort of a boarding house after his death for many years. Um, she had her own cow. It was very important to her to have her own cow so that they could have fresh milk and cheese and butter and stuff. And she would trade that for other necessities that they needed. And that's kind of how a lot of those folks up there survived. You know, you, if you had chickens, you traded eggs for something. If you had cows, mm -hmm. you traded that kind of stuff. Um, the majority of the miners themselves did not get wealthy doing these jobs. They were paid by the mine owners who were wealthy, um, but they themselves were not wealthy. Well, um, now it looks this, I, I can't get over the beauty when I oh, look it's at, gorgeous. at your pictures and all the aspen trees. And mm -hmm. I keep picturing it being so quiet and all you can hear are the aspen trees. You know, the best way mm -hmm. I can describe an aspen tree in the wind is a glistening sound. <laughs> it does. It's kind of like a really quiet shh, shh, whisp, like a silent, like a, it's almost like a bell, but quieter. Yeah, and so when relaxing. you don't hear the four wheelers going on up there, that's all you do here. It's, it's extremely peaceful up there. Um, well, it's like a, it's, you know, those rain sticks, it's kind of like that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's a good way to describe it. And yeah, it's, and like I said, if you're there in the summer, it's very green, you know, you have all the leaves on the aspen trees and there's wildflowers everywhere, the mountain wildflowers. So there's a lot of pinks and purples and yellows here and there and there's the long tall grasses and it's it's such a lovely peaceful place and then like I said in the fall all those aspen turn gold for a very short time like you have to get up there quick mm -hmm. because the, it's a high enough elevation that they don't stay on the trees long um, before they fall off and then you have naked trees um, but it for that me it's about a two-week period that the the leaves are gold it's and the grass is sort of gold, everything's gold, and you have these white and gray headstones popping up, it's absolutely gorgeous to, to stand there and, and imagine that. And then of course in the winter, all those trees are bare. And so you can stand in any of the six cemeteries at that point and see the mountains around you. And it's absolutely gorgeous then too. So I say it's breathtaking no matter which season you go up there um, because the spot that they picked right above their town is just gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. Well, you said you were talking about that original cemetery. Did they move the bodies or are the they, bodies still there? They did. So in um, 1880, they actually put um, a notice in the newspaper at the time saying they were going to have a couple of days where people could come and help transfer the bodies of loved ones from that cemetery to the current cemetery. Um, and then at one point they had the city remove some more. However, they did not actually remove all of the bodies. There are still some bodies, um, probably in that spot, there's houses over it. So the reason they moved the cemetery was because it was a good place to put more houses. So they wanted to move the cemetery to its current location because they decided they could put a whole nother row of houses up there. Um, several years a ago- It's a common story. Huh? It's a common story. Yeah, so several <laughs> years ago, there was a woman who was having work done on her plumbing up there. And as they were digging down through her yard, they came across a body. Actually, they came across a pair of legs with boots on um, and further found more of a body. And so they stopped, the plumbers stopped and the, the guys doing the construction work and they called the sheriff and the sheriff came in and he said, well, this looks kind of old. So they actually brought in um, an archeologist from Denver who came up and they found a little bit more. They didn't find the whole body, but they found more of the body and determined it was probably one of the old miners. Um, and then they realized that that was the location of the old cemetery. And so there's probably still a few more bodies up there that did not get uncovered and moved to the new place. Um, but the very cool thing, and there is a picture of it that I sent you, um, it's a stone like in the middle of a wall 
Um, so the lady whose yard that happened in, she went and found part of an old headstone that was in storage because a lot of the headstones got removed from the old cemetery, but didn't get put back in the new cemetery. They just got stored in town. So she went and found one of the old ones with the saying on it that she felt was appropriate to sort of mark the location of the old cemetery and, and hope that people are in their final resting place. So, um, and that one, that one right there. Yep. So that's part of an old headstone that she found that she had inserted into the wall that was already there. They removed a few of the other stones and put that in. So that does mark, I think it's right above 4th Street, I think is where that's at. Um, and it does mark the location of the original cemetery. Which... And are you able to see this from the street? You can, yeah. So like this, if you're standing on the street, you can look right at it. Um, and then the yard is actually up above your head. Um, oh, I'm going to totally check that out. I'm, yeah. I'm going up there probably next month um, with some friends for an event. And uh, I I am so excited. I've been waiting to, for everything to reopen. Oh, yes. You know, to go back up there. And I haven't been for a couple of years. And again, when we go up there, we go and stay at the hotel. It's more of a mm -hmm. staycation thing. And for some reason, we just haven't like gone out to all the historic things, which is kind of funny for us. <laughs> you <know? Right>? Well, <laughs> you and know? if you go in the summer, they have central city itself. The historical stuff has more going on in the summer, obviously, because mm -hmm. it's easier to get up there in the summer than it is in the winter. But like I said, their museum is fabulous. Um, there's a house there and I cannot remember the name of it that you can tour. Um, I don't, I think it's open after Memorial day, uh, but which it belonged to a family who, owned one of the mines up there. And actually the dining room wall is built into their mine. Um, there's sort of a safe and it was kind of a hidden entrance and exit. And I guess there's several other houses in the area that built their houses with exits and entrances into their mines to kind of protect them. So they were inside their houses. Wow. Um, yeah. And so there's a lot of really cool things to go up there and see. And it really is kind of for the state of Colorado, it's how our state really started. It all kind of starts right there in the central city area um, with all the mining and everything. And it came down from there, you know, the silver and stuff that was discovered at Leadville and stuff was a little bit later. Um, and then of course the, the gold, that they found near Pikes Peak and stuff. And that boomed just a little bit after all of that too. So um, it really, our state really gets its start as a state right there in Central City. Yeah, and that's probably exactly why I haven't done all the historical things up there is because we always go in the winter, <laughs> you know, and everything's, yeah. you know, is not as open and stuff and the, the graveyards, you know, have snow all over them and stuff. And so we definitely need to go up there. And so for those of you that would like to visit Central City, it's what, a half an hour, 45 minutes from, yeah, Denver? from Denver? Yeah, it's not that bad at all. Yeah, um, and it's there's two ways of going. You can either uh, come up through um, Golden, mm -hmm. which is my favorite way because we come from the Boulder area. Okay. So that's usually how we go. And it's a, you know, you go up a canyon on Highway 6 and then you, mm -hmm. you cut off. 119. It, it's a beautiful drive. Yeah. Um, and then they built this really nice highway that you catch. Um, it's the 40, I believe, off the, it's off I-70. Yep, so it's the, the Central City Freeway. Parkway. Mm -hmm. Parkway, that's what it is, Central yeah. City Parkway. And um, you can catch that off of uh, Highway 70, which is the major mm -hmm. highway that goes through the Rocky Mountains from Denver. Yeah. Um, and it's just like right above um, Idaho Springs. I mean, it's yeah, it would be definitely it's, a day trip you could do. Yeah, it's the exit you would take right before you go to Idaho Springs. Um, and both routes, either way you go, Central City Parkway or the, the 119 through the canyon, they're both gorgeous drives. Like either drive is really pretty. And you see a lot of, before you even get to the towns, you see all those mountain views and all the evergreens and just the way our mountains form. And um, they're both really gorgeous drives. I think the canyon drive is a little easier on some cars. I think Central City Parkway is a little steeper. Yes. So if that if that bothers you for that kind of a drive, it is a little steeper, but it's still really pretty. And also if you want to tour an old mine and kind of know more of the mining history, if you take Central City Parkway, the Heidi mine is right off of there and they give tours and stuff. And I think they do that mostly year round. So uh -huh. you can go up to the Heidi mine anytime. My husband and I did it years ago and it was a fascinating tour, but it's right there off the parkway. I'll have to check that out. Now I, I've heard that Nevadaville, which is another ghost town that's right outside of Central City, that they're not real welcoming for people to come in. Well, is that true? 
they, I've never had any problems there. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's a few people that actually still live in Nevadaville. There's a couple of houses there where people are actually living. So I don't think they want people wandering through their yard or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, what's left of their little downtown section. And there's not much, there's like a general store in the post office. The Mason's lodge is still standing and that is actually still in use. The Mason's actually still do use that lodge up there. Um, and there's a couple other buildings we've gotten out of our car there. We've taken pictures. Nobody's ever bothered us, but we don't, we don't linger. Um, but so as long as you're not doing any damage, if you're just there looking and taking pictures and you can, and it's a great place to take pictures of some of the old mines. Cause there's a whole bunch of them right there in Nevadaville that you can see that are, you know, just dying. Um, and as long as you're not wandering up into the yards and stuff where the few houses are, I think you're fine. We've never had a problem with it. Um, when we've been up there and I've gotten some great pictures. If you really want to see those old time buildings that have, that nothing has changed, it's a great place to see it. And then if you follow that Nevadaville road up further, it becomes a dirt road at that point. And you can go up around and you can actually visit the Bald Mountain Cemetery, um, which is right off of there. So Bald Mountain is kind of between you. And then you can actually follow all the way down and it comes out by the Central City Cemeteries. But Bald Mountain Cemetery was really the Nevadaville Cemetery. Um, there's also a Mason's Cemetery. Now that one, the Freemason Cemetery that's there in Nevadaville, I think is usually kept locked. And I think they want you to have permission before you go in and, and visit that one. Um, but the, the Bald Mountain Cemetery, you can go up and visit. And that one's okay. beautiful too. So that one, um, that one is filled with not as many aspen trees as the other ones. It's more evergreen trees and stuff, but it's a very peaceful little cemetery too. I didn't know that one was there. I'll have to check it out. Next yeah, it kind of hides there. back there. The first time I finally found it, I was following directions that I had found online because they said the road was unmarked. So I was looking for an unmarked road. Well, it has actually been marked since then. So I kept my eyes like roved right over the sign that marked it. And I passed it like six or seven times before I realized <laughs> I needed to turn down that road to get to the cemetery. So <laughs> now I would not recommend following the road. I would go back out onto that main dirt road. There is a road that goes past on the other side, but unless you have a vehicle that's meant for off-roading, don't go that way. I did it once. I made it but it was a little, little scary. So yeah, definitely know your roads before you go up there because, yep. you know, again, it was a mining area and there's a lot of dirt roads that, that can be scary mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing. So make sure you definitely have a map up there. You know, you're not necessarily going to be able to get internet either. Yeah. I was going to say, don't rely on internet service because once you're up there, it's gone. So yeah, yeah. download Same your map. Do you get good internet when you're you in can get City? it? Well, it comes and goes. It depends on where you're at. <laughs> if you're a little lower down in Central City, maybe not so much. I can sort of get it up in the cemeteries, I think, just because it's high enough. Uh -huh. um, so it comes and goes. But yeah, if you're really worried about not knowing your way around, I would have printed maps that you can follow or directions because you, service is unreliable. <laughs> For yeah, cell and that's always important to know, you know, mm -hmm. it's like I always print everything out because we, you know, we do ghost towns and we go, we're out in the middle of nowhere and stuff. And half the time I don't have internet. And so I always have everything printed out, directions, everything before I ever leave the house, um, you know, and my notes too. Yep. <laughs> you know, I always have all that printed out because half the time I have no internet. You know, yeah. it just doesn't exist. Well, if you decide to go up to Central City, we recommend Ameristar as a hotel, but it is a day trip from Denver. But Ameristar is a really nice hotel and it's not cheap either. Um, you know, and it's, and it's comparable to, you know, a, a hotel that you would have is fine in another gambling town. And yeah. there are other casinos that are up there um, that have hotels connected that are cheaper. Um, I've just only ever stayed in Maristar. It's always been kind of a treat to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. It's very nice. My <laughs> husband and I have stayed there several times. Um, we've stayed in some of the other ones. They're all very nice, very clean, yeah. comfortable. Um, and, and it, yeah, and the service is always good. It's been good at any of the hotels that we've stayed at up there. So well, before the epidemic, they used to have all you could eat um, crab mm -hmm. legs at Ameristar. And that's, you know, that was a favorite. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, that is And then definitely I think they have a live entertainment every so often, too. Yes. But. So if somebody wanted to find your podcast, uh, what's the best way to find you on? Um, well, we have our own website. Uh, it's the Ordinary Extraordinary Cemetery. 
podcast.com. That's the podcast website. Um, we are available. The podcast is available on any um, format where you listen to podcasts. So Spotify, Google podcast, Apple podcasts, we're on all of them. Um, and then you can find us on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we are at the ordinary extraordinary cemetery. We are on Twitter at ord extra sim. So it's all a little shorter. Um, so yeah, yeah. And I think that's it. <laughs> well, what I'll do is I will put a link to Jenny and Diane's um, podcast down in the description of this podcast and video. Um, and definitely check them out. They have just some wonderful subjects, not just for, in Colorado, but across the board. I mean, you're, you, you've got subjects that are across the nation or across the world. Mm -hmm. They're just fascinating subjects. I love Thanks. listening to you guys. <laughs> Thank you. But Jay, thank you so much for coming on today. This has just been so interesting. I, you know, I didn't know half this the this information about Central City, your wealth of knowledge. And oh, I thanks. can't wait until we got we, we can go up together. Yes. And you can show me some of these things. I would absolutely love that. I would love to take you on a tour of their cemeteries. They are gorgeous. But and the town itself, like I said, the <laughs> town is fun. I've had a lot of fun there. I fortunately when I really started researching. Um, I talked to a lot of local people there that are very into their own genealogy and research, and they've been fabulous people to, to talk to, and they've been very helpful. They've allowed me to go through their archives in the museum to research stuff, and um, it's, been, it, it's been a joy to, to learn more about Central City and Blackhawk and that whole community up there. So Yeah, it's just wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on, and thank you thank for, you for me. listening, everyone. Well, we could leave off with what we leave off with on our podcast switches until we meet again. Until we meet again. I like that. Find more episodes of The Strange Podcast on major platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, <laughs> iHeartRadio, Google Play Music, Pandora, Radio Public, and more. Please subscribe today.